let's get this show on the road. Welcome to today's live stream program with Streamable Learning and Museum of the Rockies. My name is Jamie August. I'll be your host for today's program. I'd like to introduce you to Lisa Verwise. She's the Museum of the Rockies Registrar, Registrar and Collections Manager for Cultural History. In just a minute, Lisa will spend the next 30 to 40 minutes engaging with us about homesteading in Montana. I'm joining you today from my home, and Lisa will be sharing from MOR's Museum of the Rockies Curatorial Center for the Humanities. Though the museum is temporarily closed to the public, we are excited to share the museum's research and collections with you today. So thanks again for joining us. Before we get started, I wanna make you aware of two features that Zoom has. One is the chat box and the other is the Q&A area. You'll see those options at the bottom of your screen. Lisa may ask you questions throughout the program. Go ahead and answer those in the chat box. If you have questions throughout the program, put them in the Q&A area. We will get to as many questions as we can throughout the program. We have not been super successful at getting to all of them. So if we don't get to your question, I challenge you at the end of this program to do a little research of your own. See if you can't find that answer. So let's begin. We're excited to be with you today. I'm gonna to turn it over to Lisa and she's gonna tell us a more. Thanks, Lisa. Great, thank you, Jamie. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all again. And I'm excited to be chatting with you today about homesteading in Montana. Before we jump into it, I do want to tell you a little bit more about Museum of the Rockies and about myself. Oops. So for those of you who maybe aren't from Montana or haven't had a chance to come and see us yet, Museum of the Rockies is located down in Bozeman, Montana. I've circled it there in red on the map. And we're located just north of Yellowstone National Park, and we're part of the Northern Rocky region of the United States. If you ever have a chance to come and see us, this is the front door of the Museum of the Rockies. And of course, you might be able to see here, we have a T-Rex that's waiting to welcome you. And that probably tells you that we have a lot of dinosaur bones at our museum. But what we also have are a lot of cultural history artifacts. And cultural history artifacts are any types of artifacts that people have made or used or touched and that we can study to explore how people lived in the past. And that's exactly what I work with here at the museum. I work with cultural history artifacts. So here I am in one of our many storage areas. I'm also sitting in one of our storage areas currently. And my job here is to make sure that those cultural history artifacts last for as long as possible so that we can use them for programs like this one today so that we can have researchers come and study them and learn about how people in the past lived and we also use them for our exhibits so you can see there i'm surrounded by some cultural history artifacts and that can be anything from arrowheads to photographs to clothing to furniture. If you look around your house right now or wherever you are and you see all the things around you, those are all cultural history artifacts as well. Those are all things that if we looked at them, we'd be able to learn something about you and about how you lived. And so that's what I work with here. And that's what we're going to be using today to explore homesteading in Montana. So I'm going to be sharing with you some slides that have pictures of the past, and those are all artifacts. And then I've actually pulled out a couple of our historic artifacts to go ahead and share with you. So at some point, we'll uh, take a look at those actual artifacts. I'll be holding them up for you to see. So I'm excited to talk about a couple different topics with you. You can see on the screen here, we're going to start up here with what brought homesteaders to Montana. We're also going to explore a little bit what did homesteaders have to do when they arrived here? How did they start their lives in the state? We're going to learn a little bit about uh, what can we learn about homesteaders and homestead life by looking at their artifacts and how similar or different are their lives from our lives today. And I'm also going to have some vocabulary terms sprinkled throughout. So if you see a word that's highlighted in the color blue, you might want to take particular, pay particular attention to that word. It might be something important. 
I will also go ahead and ask you some questions throughout our chat today. So be ready to type in some answers to our chat box. And so we're gonna go ahead and start with what brought people to Montana? Why did the homesteaders come here in the first place? And for that, we have to go all the way back to the Civil War and President Abraham Lincoln. You see a picture of him there. And way back in 1862, he signed something called the Homestead Act, the 1862 Homestead Act. And what that said was that any current or future citizen could stake out a homestead or a piece of land of up to 160 acres. And that's what we call a claim or a homestead claim. So when I say something like they, they had to stake their claim or they proved up their claim, that's what I'm talking about is this plot of land that our homesteaders could claim. They also then had to build a home on that piece of land on that claim and cultivate it or farm it for the next five years. And if they did that, if they were successful, if they lived on that claim and farmed it for five years, they could have all of that land for free, which was a pretty great deal. Now, if you're like me, you might not quite understand how big 160 acres is. So my first question that I'm gonna to ask to you is how big do you think a single acre is? Do you think that it's about the same size as a football field? Is it about the same size as a tennis court? Or is it about the same size as a basketball court? So I'll go ahead and let you type your answers into the chat box. How big do you think an acre is? And I'll keep talking for just another minute or two and then we'll come back to the answer. So still on the question of what brought people to Montana, the Homestead Act that Abraham Lincoln signed was open to lots of different types of people, not to everyone, but to most people who were in the United States. And that was really great. It meant that women could use the Homestead Act. It meant that immigrants who were moving from other countries could actually take advantage of the Homestead Act. People who were maybe working class or lower income from cities on the East Coast or in the Midwest, they could also use the Homestead Act. And so could tenant farmers. And tenant farmers are people who maybe didn't have enough money to buy their own farmland. So instead they rented land from other people and farmed that land instead. That was primarily people who were working, especially in the Midwest and out on the East Coast. And all of these different types of people were drawn to Montana and drawn to the West for a lot of different reasons. But one of the big ones was that for most of these people, this was their only chance to own land. Uh, they might not have had enough money to buy land otherwise, and they might not have enough money to put up their own homes otherwise. And so the Homestead Act was a really great chance for people to be able to get a lot of land for essentially no money. And the picture here that you see is actually two women homesteaders in Montana on horseback. So Jamie, did we have some guesses about how big an acre is? We have guesses for all three. <laughs> Is there one that seems more than the other? Maybe football field. Hmm. If you were a football field guesser, you were just about right. So way to go, everyone. Thanks for guessing. An acre is just a little bit smaller than a football field. It's basically a football field without any end zones. So when you think about 160 acres, that's a huge piece of land. That's basically 160 football fields and you could have those all for free. So that's what the Homestead Act was giving to people. Now, even though Abraham Lincoln signed that act into effect way back in 1862, we actually didn't see too many homesteaders coming to Montana until 1900, when we had our first homestead boom. And a boom is a big, fast increase in, in this case, population. So in 1900, lots of people start coming to Montana to homestead. And then we see a second, even bigger boom happen in 1909. And there are a few different reasons that we're gonna explore that help bring those people to Montana. The first one was railroads. By this time, we had several railroads that had put tracks down all throughout the state. And so number one, Montana was a lot easier to get to. You didn't necessarily have to take a wagon here anymore. You could get on a train to get to Montana. And those railroads actually 
really heavily advertised to bring people to Montana because the railroad companies wanted more cities and more towns along the railroad tracks. And so our railroads actually put out advertising brochures like the one that's on the screen here. And they sent those brochures all around the country and they even sent them overseas to other countries. And these brochures would say things like, move to Montana, the weather is beautiful, the winters aren't that cold, which if you live in Montana or a northern state, you know that that is not true. But this is why we saw a really big rush or a boom of homesteaders come in, and especially homesteaders from other countries, because the railroads sent these brochures to places like Germany and Sweden and Norway. And so we see a lot of immigrants coming over to take advantage of the Homestead Act. Around this time, we also see some agricultural technology improvements or better farming tools. And the tools that are out there are maybe not necessarily new, but they're more available to our homestead farmers and they make homesteading a lot faster, um, a lot easier, a lot more efficient. And so on the brochure here, you actually see a homesteader using one of those farming tools. That's a plow there that he has hitched up to a couple of horses. And we have a really similar plow here that I'll show you near the end of our talk today. So technology was really helpful to our homesteaders coming out at this time. And finally, the government actually increased the size of the Homestead Act. So where you used to be able to get 160 acres, now you could claim up to 320 acres. So that's double the amount of land. And so at this point, we have tens of thousands of people moving to Montana to start homesteading. Uh, we actually had the most homesteaders and the most homesteaded land out of any other state in the country that had homesteading. So once our homesteaders got here, what did they have to do when they arrived? Because of course, they're coming from all over the country or maybe they came across an ocean and they don't know anybody in Montana probably. So what do they do once they step off their train or, or um, get here on their, in their wagons? The first thing that they have to do, of course, is to stake that claim. They need to find their 160 or their 320 acres and that is actually a little bit harder than you would maybe think it is because of course we have a boom, right? There's lots of people moving to the state, so you have lots of competition. And also you wanted to make sure that you were getting a good piece of land because if you remember, the Homestead Act says that you have to farm that land. So you wanna make sure that you're getting good soil. You wanna make sure that there is water somewhere nearby or that you can dig a well. So our homesteaders, first of all, had to figure out where they were going to live. What was the area of land that they were going to claim? And then once they found that claim, once they staked out their area and filed for it, they had to build a house. So here's my second question for you. You can go ahead and use that chat box again. I want to know what materials did you think our homesteaders built their houses from? So what did they use to build up their houses? And there's an example here in this picture with two, two little kids and I think a cat down here in front of the house. So I'll let you answer that question. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about their houses and then we'll get some of those answers um, from Jamie. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the size of the house that the homesteaders built. And then we'll explore what they made those houses from. So depending on where the homesteaders lived, there were different size requirements for how big of a house they had to build. And usually the smallest house that they could build was around 12 feet by 14 feet which is really, really small. That's probably about the size of maybe your parents' bedroom or maybe your living room at home. So if you can think of trying to fit everything that's in your house right now into something the size of a bedroom, that's what the homesteaders were living in. Some areas said that homesteaders had to include other things in their houses, like a glass window or a solid door, but that wasn't necessarily a requirement everywhere. Some of the homesteaders did build houses that were a little bit bigger, but still not much bigger, maybe 10 feet by 20 feet or 12 feet by 20 feet. So still very small. So Jamie, what materials do we think our Montana homesteaders are building their houses from? We have the guesses of wood, sod, dirt, 
straw, rock and stone, tar, and tumbleweeds. Ah, you guys are the smartest, seriously. You got all of the big three that were used in Montana. Uh, logs are usually the number one thing that we think of when we think of homesteaders houses or pioneer houses. But most of our homesteaders in Montana settled on the eastern side of the state, and there actually aren't that many trees available on the eastern part of the state. So while we had some log cabins, it wasn't necessarily the most popular choice because the resource, the logs, just weren't available to most people. This is a wooden house, though, that, is, that you see in the picture here. Sod or dirt was a really popular choice. There was definitely plenty of dirt in eastern Montana. So our homesteaders who decided to go with sod houses or soddies, uh, what they did is they pulled up dirt and they formed it into bricks and built their houses that way. And you see here that this sod house does have a glass window and it does have a solid door. And Soddies were a really good choice for a lot of people because it was easy to get dirt, you could build them quickly and cheaply, but dirt wasn't always the best material either. If it rained too hard, your roof might collapse or your floor would become mud, or if the dirt got too dry, you would actually have dirt raining on you from the ceiling, which is not great if you're trying to sleep or maybe cook food or just relax in your house. So a lot of people who built sod houses um, changed to a different material as soon as they had enough money or time to do that. And the third most popular choice was a tar paper shack. And tar paper shacks were also really popular choices. One, because you could actually buy a kit with all of the materials once you got off the train. So you could have kind of a ready-made kit that you could just purchase and put up really quickly on your land. You can see it is made of wood, and then that wood has tar paper around the inside of it. And tar paper is um, a really heavy construction paper that's waterproof. And we do still use tar paper today sometimes when building houses, especially um, underneath roof shingles. So still something that we use today. And you can see this tar paper shack also has a door and a solid window. So those are our three most popular materials, but the homesteaders certainly used other things like rocks and stones and some of the other things that you mentioned as well. When they were building their houses, they also had to be careful to make sure that they had water accessible. They didn't have electricity or indoor plumbing, and so you needed to make sure that you put your house somewhere near water or that you dug a well to make sure that you could be able to get water. And sometimes you had to dig down 40 or 50 or 60 feet to be able to get water to your property. Now the last thing that our homesteaders had to start doing once they got to Montana was make money. Now, if you remember, our Homestead Act says that our homesteaders have to cultivate their land, they have to farm their land, but in order to do that, they have to have tools and they have to have seed. And some people did come here with those tools. If you were a tenant farmer, for example, that came to Homestead, you might bring tools with you. But if you didn't have tools, if you didn't have seeds, then you would need to find some way to purchase those things. And so you might do that by taking out a loan. And you also might do that by taking another job if you settled somewhat near a town. So if you settled near one of those railroad towns, then you might take a job on the railroad or you might do something else in town like be a carpenter or a blacksmith or maybe a teacher or a nurse to help bring in some money. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the things that our homesteaders were planting. So they had to farm their land for five years and we had homesteaders all across our state, but they were planting usually slightly different things because the soil and the weather is different from the west side of the state to the east side. So in Western Montana, our homesteaders are planting things like hay. They're planting different types of grains. This is barley. And they're planting fruit like apples and like cherries. And if anybody here is from the east or western half of the state, you know that lots of cherries are still being grown over there. And on our eastern side of the state, our homesteaders are mostly 
um, planting things like sugar beets, and that's what we make sugar out of. They're also planting flax, and you can make things like linen fabric out of flax. And they're planting wheat. And wheat is the most popular choice of a homesteader crop because it's bringing in the most amount of money. And this is kind of what the cash crop was for our eastern homesteaders, which again, most of the homesteaders in Montana did settle on the east side of the state. So they're planting wheat and they're making quite a bit of money off of that wheat. It is important to remember too that in order to make money off of your crops, you have to go through a whole growing season first. So our homesteaders didn't make money off of their crops right away. They had to grow them, harvest them, and sell them before they made money. So the first year of a homesteader's life is really, really difficult. You not only packed up and left everything that you knew behind, you moved across the country or maybe across the ocean, you had to find land, build a house, plant a crop, make money, and take care of your household and your family. So that's not a very easy life. And a lot of homesteads didn't even make it out of the first year. Lots of homesteads did fail in their first year of, of trying to homestead. But let's go ahead and take a look at some objects at the museum to learn a little bit more about what the life looked like for that first year or for the people who uh, were successful for the next coming years. We so saw, I wanted, sorry, oh, okay. interrupt you. was there fresh water available at these locations? In some places, if you could find land that had um, a creek or a spring, that would be perfect. But if not, then you would have to dig down and dig a well in order to get water. But you definitely needed water. You needed to find water in some way, shape, or form. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. So I have a question now for you guys. Before we take a look at our homesteaders' possessions and what they brought with them, I want to know what would you bring with you if you had to move from your house? If you had to move to a much smaller place and you couldn't bring everything that you owned, what types of things would you bring? And I'll let Jamie just go ahead and read those off as they roll in. But a couple of things that you should think about are what are things that are important or special to you? What are things that you think would be necessary or helpful in your new house? Or what are some things that you use every day, even if they maybe aren't, if they maybe aren't that exciting? My cats, some books, ooh, a wood stove, smart, mm -hmm. smart, smart. My puppy, bed, clothes, cat, food, bed, stove, dogs, shoes, money, pots and pans, books, plates and silverware, <laughs> my iPad, stove, music, I like that one. A phone. Mm -hmm. Great. Those are all really great answers. I would bring my dogs too. I have two of them. I would make sure to bring them. And the things that you're thinking of are really the same types of things that our homesteaders were thinking of too, because they had to fit whatever they wanted to bring inside a wagon or a box car. So they probably couldn't bring everything that they owned, but they thought about what types of personal things would they want to bring? So things that reminded them of their families, maybe photo albums or other personal things like clothing or toys or musical instruments or animals. Those are all important. They also thought about what types of things would be important to use in their household. So they would bring things like dishes and sewing machines and wood stoves if they could, or maybe sometimes beds. Or they would think of what would they maybe need to, to be successful in their farm. And so some people, if they did have these things, would bring um, farming tools, they would bring animals. If they already had farm animals, they could put those on the train and bring them as well. And they might bring building materials to help build that house once they got there. So I'm first going to tell you just a little bit about um, this quilt that's here on the screen. I, it was too big for me to bring out to show you, and then I'll show you some of the other objects that our homesteaders brought as well. And so while we're going through these, I want you to think about, do you have something similar in your home? How is their life similar or different from yours? How is it more difficult? Is it easier? 
what are some similarities that we share? And so this quilt here was actually brought to Montana by a homesteader in 1898. And he brought his, he came with his wife and his children from the southeastern part of the country and he, they came on a train and he brought this quilt which his mother had made for him so this is very much a personal item this is going to remind him of his family um, and of his mother and of their memories together but a quilt was also really practical. It's a warm blanket, and so you could use it on your bed. As we all know, Montana winters are really chilly. You would definitely want a good warm blanket on your bed. But you could also use a quilt for things like a door. If you don't have a door in your house, you can hang a quilt, at least in the summertime or the spring or fall, and help keep out dust or wind. You could also use it in the winter as insulation. So you could hang your quilt on your wall if you had some cracks in your wall or if your window was letting in too much cold air, you would hang a quilt in the window as well. So really a lot of different things that you could do with a quilt in your homestead. So I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and show you a few of our other items. So the first one that I want to share with you is actually this hand crank coffee grinder. You can also tell me if it's hard to see me or hear me while I'm showing you these things. We actually have two coffee grinders. The other one is very heavy, so I'm not going to pick it up, but it looks like this. And coffee grinders or tools like these kitchen tools were important for our homesteaders for a couple different reasons. So first of all, they couldn't just walk to the store or drive to the store to be able to get ready-made food. You might have to walk or ride your horse for half a day to go to a grocery store. So you still had to do a lot of food preparation at home. So for our coffee grinder, it opens up. You can put coffee in there and then you turn this handle and it spits coffee out the front. Now you could also use a coffee grinder for wheat. And we know that wheat is one of our main crops on the eastern side of the state. And so you could use a coffee grinder to grind wheat into flour and then make different kinds of baked goods like bread or cakes or biscuits, anything that you need flour for. Because again, you aren't gonna go to the store to buy a loaf of bread. You're gonna need to make that on your own homestead. Some of the other things that I brought out for you, speaking of or home goods specifically, like I said, they didn't have any plumbing in their shacks, obviously, but they were near water. And so this, it's really pretty actually, this is a wash basin. So if you think about all of the times that you use water throughout the day, whether that's to brush your teeth or wash your hands or maybe do laundry or your parents do laundry, imagine having to carry that water inside every single time you needed to use it. And so our homesteaders didn't take nearly as many baths as we might take now and they didn't necessarily take showers, but they would use wash basins like this to wash their hands and face somewhat regularly. And this is the type of thing that you would probably bring with you. You probably got this from wherever your original home was, maybe on the East Coast. It's made out of porcelain or ceramic. It's got a pretty design on it. So something to also brighten up your home to make your dirt shack or your tar paper shack a little bit more homely. Some of the other home goods that I brought out for you uh, these are heavy, so I'm going to try to angle my computer so you can see them. They might look familiar to you. These are actually two different irons. Now, when we think about how difficult it might be to bring in all of that water that you needed, think about doing laundry if you don't have plumbing, you don't have a washing machine. Your whole family would do laundry, and it would take a really long time. And once your laundry was finally done, you had to iron everything, but you don't have electricity. So even though these might look to be a similar shape as our irons now, they certainly worked a little bit differently. So for those of you who brought a wood stove with you, that was smart because that's how you heat up your irons. So that's why we have a couple different irons as well. You would put these on your stove top and let them heat up. 
And then when one was hot, you would make sure it had a handle on it. This has a wood handle and you would use it until it cooled off. When it was cool, you would put it back on the stove. You can take this handle off, put it on your other iron and then use that one until it cools down. So you can see when we look at some of these objects in our collection, you can see how much more time and energy it takes to do these really simple tasks that most of us can do really quickly now in our lives. The last home object I brought out for you is this, which looks kind of like a maraca, kind of like a musical instrument, but it's actually called a darning egg and you use this to repair your clothing in your homestead. So our homesteaders didn't have nearly the amount of clothes or home goods that we have now. And so if something broke, if something got a hole in it, you would have to fix it. So darning eggs were really good to stretch clothing or, or fabric across so that you could mend them with your needle and thread. And you, these were really good for fixing socks. So you would put socks over the top, hold them with the handle, and then you could patch, you could sew a patch on them with your needle and thread. And I don't know about you guys, but I just threw away a pair of socks yesterday that had holes in them. So that's certainly a little bit different how we live now versus how our homesteaders would live because they didn't have quite the resources that we had, or they might not have the money to be able to replace things that broke or got holes in them. And I do want to show, oh, go ahead. Is there any one thing that you would say was the most important to them in their homestead environment? I would say that um, at some point being able to get a stove is going to be really important because you want to be able to stay warm in the winter. You can cook on it. You can boil your water to do laundry. Um, it's uh, to me that would be the most important. You can live without a lot of things. Our homesteaders didn't have the a number of dishes that we have, for example. They had way fewer clothes than we had. Some of them didn't even have furniture because they weren't really spending that much time inside. But a stove would be really important to be able to make food, keep your house warm, uh, heat up your water, things like that. So one of the last things I'm going to show you, which is fairly large and a little bit far away from me, so I'll get a little closer here, is a plow. So remember I talked about some of the um, agricultural improvements that were accessible to our homesteaders, and plows like this were really important. So the handles are in the back there and it has two steel blades and you had to use a plow in order to prepare your land for planting. You could hitch this to any animals that you might have. So horses would be great or oxen, but it was really important because you had, remember, 160 or 320 acres. And if you had to try to plow all of that by hand, it would take you forever. It would be backbreaking work. And so plows allowed our farmers to really be able to turn over their land quickly, efficiently, and with a lot less effort and energy than they previously had to farm their land with. Do you have any questions about any of those objects before we finish out here? Good. <laughs> Maybe not direct relation, but good questions. Um, where Were there any stores or did they just trade for things? Thanks. Yeah, there were definitely stores. So there um, were stores generally in these smaller railroad towns and cities. So the railroads actually caused hundreds of towns to be formed in Montana. So if there's anybody out there who's ever been to the High Line or maybe lives on the High Line, a lot of our towns up there are homesteader towns. So places like Haver and Wolf Point um, and Glasgow, those were all founded by homesteaders. And so they would build up things um, like stores, general stores, lumber stores, and that's because of course the railroads went through there and so they could get goods and services. And so our homesteaders could order things through the mail especially or buy them in town, but it's definitely a lot slower. If you settled 
15 miles outside of town, it might take you a really long time to get into town. So you wouldn't necessarily just run to the store if you forgot something. You would need, you would probably just do without it until the next time you took a, a big trip into town. Couple questions on the iron. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know if it's hot? <laughs> uh well you could probably i'm not sure how they would tell i would tell by maybe flicking some water on it and it would steam um i think also you could just assume it would be hot once you tried to use it if it wasn't flattening out the clothing if it wasn't smoothing it out it wouldn't be hot enough so you should put it back on your stove for a little bit longer great um, we definitely have a few more questions. Do you want those now or hold on? I just have one more slide. So we'll finish up and then I'll take a couple more questions. So I want to talk a little bit about the bust of homesteading. So we had the boom, we had tons of people coming into the state of Montana, but then we had a lot of failures or a bust. And you can see I put some numbers on the left hand side of the screen there from the US Census. And so what the census does is it counts how many people are in a state every so often every couple of years. There's actually a census happening right now. And you can see the boom. You can see how in the 1900 census, Montana had 243,000 people. And by 1918, Montana had 769,000 people. So that's a huge increase. So that's those two booms that we had, everybody moving in. And then from 1918 to 1920, we actually see a big bust. We see a lot of people leaving the state and up to 50% of the homesteads actually failed at this point and in the early 1920s. And that happened for a few different reasons. Um, in 1918, actually, there was a really big drought. We had really low rainfall for a while. And so it was hard for our homesteaders to grow their crops. We also, in 1919, had grasshopper plagues come into the state. So these big swarms of grasshoppers came in and ate tons of the farmers' crops. And so these farmers are going into pretty big debt and they don't, they don't have any crops to be able to sell and make money back on. And then the crop prices dropped. So the farmers weren't growing as many crops and then they weren't selling them for as much money. And so all of those things combined with how difficult this life was, how small the houses were, how hard the work was, led a lot of people to actually just walk away from their homesteads. And that's what happened all across the country, but it also happened in Montana. So. Uh, around 1920 and, and over the next few years, we see a lot of homesteaders leaving the state and abandoning their, their homesteads and their shacks. So our homesteading movement never really recovered after that. But without our homesteaders, we wouldn't have tons of the towns that are in Montana today. And they made a really big impact on how the land was used and also a big impact on what we know about farming in the state. So with that, I will take any other questions that we might have time for. There were a number of questions about how they may have bathed themselves or relieved yeah. themselves or... Yep, so they didn't bathe nearly as often as we would bathe, but they did have larger tubs that they could use to take baths in. Um, often they would share that bath water and then use it to maybe clean parts of their house, but you would not be bathing that often. And because of course you did have to bring all of that water into your house and you wouldn't be sitting fully in a tub either. It would be um, more of a putting a, an arm in and maybe scrubbing your arm or using a sponge or a rag to clean the rest of your body. So we didn't see these big full bathtubs like you probably have in your house. So just a very different way to take a bath. Were there phones at this time? Not for our homesteaders. I'm actually not 
there may have been phones and phone lines, but not for most people. Just like there was electricity at this time, but there was not electricity that was running out to homesteads. So there are some things that have been invented at this time and that some people are using in places, but that would not be available all the way out in homestead communities. Great. And then did homesteaders use a lot of home herbal remedies since doctors would not have been as close by? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there was certainly more use of herbal remedies if you knew them um, and more, I would say probably uh, getting help from your neighbors if you needed to, but you are definitely right that the doctors were fewer and farther between and that you wouldn't be going to them nearly as regularly as you might visit a doctor now. Great. And let's maybe wrap it up with this question from Victoria and Isabel. How did these people get to Montana? Most of them came on the railroad tracks, but before the railroad, um, and the railroad was really interesting because it gave people who were coming out to Homestead, it gave them a discount on their ticket prices, and it also gave them a discount on renting a boxcar to put all of their belongings in. But if they didn't come on the train, if they didn't take a train out here, then a lot of them came by wagon. So our earlier homesteaders especially were in wagons or on wagon trains. And a couple, some homesteaders could have taken a steamboat um, up the rivers, up the Missouri, but that wasn't very common. Most of the homesteaders are coming out by railroad or by wagon. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa, and thank you all for joining us today. I hope you took a few new interesting facts away to tell your friends or family members about homesteading in Montana. Um, I wanted to tell you about our upcoming live stream events as well. On Fridays, we're excited to host Fossil Fridays. That also happens at 1210. This Friday, we'll be dating the fossil record with Amy Atwater. Um, join us then. And I think that's all for today. Anything else, Lisa? Nope. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for all of your great questions. We'll see you again soon. Enjoy the rest of your day.